Our topic for this session is biliary emergencies. Well, our first case was an acute presentation with right upper quadrant pain, but it's the thalassemia that is particularly interesting here. You can see the expansile changes of all of the visualized skeletal structures with associated soft tissue masses on the inner aspects of the ribs and in the pelvis, as you'll see lower down. Here on the bone windows, you can see the expansion of the skeletal structures themselves, and again, those adjacent soft tissue masses. In the pelvis, you really can see the prominent soft tissue masses and the erosion of the adjacent cortex. And on the bone windows, can really appreciate the expansion of the visualized skeletal structures. Note the spacing of the trabeculi throughout the iliac bones. In the right upper quadrant, there are classic bilirubin gallstones, varied in size, densely calcified, and associated with layering milk of calcium within the gallbladder. So here are those skeletal changes. Note again the expansion. And in the pelvis, most notable there, and involving all of the visualized skeletal structures. And again, the soft tissue masses adjacent to the ribs. And here in the iliacs. And then, of course, let's appreciate those gallstones, varied in size, densely calcified, and with layering milk of calcium. So that is a case of thalassemia with extramedullary hematopoiesis and erythrocyte turnover resulting in bilirubin gallstones. Our next case is emphysematous cholecystitis. This is the bane of ER physicians. These patients, frequently diabetic, uh, frequently present with generalized illness and no localizing symptoms. So it can be a real diagnostic coup to pick this up. The question is always, well, with emphysematous organs in general, is it intramural or intraluminal gas that I'm looking for? And the answer is both. Most likely it will start within the wall, but frequently quickly progress to intraluminal. Uh, and you can see some cases where there is just intraluminal gas. Here you can see the culprit is this stone in the cystic duct. And right down to the neck of the gallbladder, we still see the intraluminal gas. Note there is extensive stranding all surrounding the portal region. So here is the intraluminal and intramural gas outlining the entirety of the gallbladder. There is the layering fluid level. And you note it looks as though the gallbladder wall is just about to perforate there in the fundal region. And again, this stone lies right at the neck at the base of the cystic duct. You can actually pick up the common bile duct here and see the cystic duct separating from it posteriorly. So there's the cystic duct. And you can then follow that up right to that stone. And you see that is the junction of the gallbladder neck and cystic duct. So a very common place for such a stone to lodge and a classic case of emphysematous cholecystitis. Our next case is of Meritzi syndrome where there is obstruction of the common hepatic duct by a stone in the cystic duct. There is clearly very marked dilation of the intrahepatic ductal system in the gallbladder itself, there are multiple classic cholesterol stones, faceted, peripherally calcified. There is also an intrahepatic fluid collection consistent with cholecystitis and an intrahepatic abscess. Most importantly, though, there is this obstruction of the common hepatic duct. You can see the dilated duct above the level of the obstructing stone. 
And most importantly, there is a soft tissue layer surrounding that stone, showing that it is in the cystic duct and is in fact pushing on the posterior aspect of the common hepatic duct, right there. So, right there, that stone in the cystic duct or gallbladder neck is pressing on the posterior aspect of the common hepatic duct and causing obstruction of that duct without being in that duct. Here we have it on the coronals. Again, the important thing to note is that soft tissue layer over the superior aspect of the most medial stone, showing that it is within the gallbladder neck or cystic duct. So that is a case of Maritzi syndrome with an associated abscess in the right liver lobe. Our next case is a gallstone ileus. This of course manifests as biliary air. Note the central arborizing gas here in the uh, periportal region. And lower down you can see a thick-walled gallbladder fundus with a little bit of contrast or calcification within it and a small focus of gas. There is actually a communication between that gallbladder fundus and the adjacent duodenum. Lastly, you can see a thick-walled dilated duodenum and a large faceted gallstone in the second most common region for a gallstone ileus to cause obstruction, that being at the ligament of trites. The first most common region, of course, being the ileocecal region. So let's take a look at this gallbladder. There is the portal gas. Right here is the communication between the duodenum and the gallbladder, which you can see is contracted but contains a small focus of gas. Contrast enhancement most likely. And there again is that communication between the duodenum and the gallbladder body. Now let's look at that dilated thick-walled third portion of the duodenum and the impacted stone at the ligament of trites. So that is a case of gallstone ileus with a proximal small bowel obstruction. Our next case is a bioloma, the frequent and dreaded complication of cholecystectomy. You can see obviously multiple cholecystectomy clips are present as well as a common duct stent and in a very typical distribution and location you can see this large subcapsular hypodense fluid collection outlining the left liver lobe and extending to the portal region where it ultimately did originate. So there again, a pretty typical distribution for a postoperative bioloma with its origin there in the portal region in the region of those cholecystectomy clips. Right there. So that is a postoperative bioloma in a subcapsular distribution. Our next case is sclerosing cholangitis. There is significant dilation and approximation of the bile ducts here in the posterior right liver lobe, which demonstrates significant atrophy. In addition, there is a featureless colon with hypodense walls consistent with fatty infiltration and chronic inflammation all adding up to ulcerative colitis with associated sclerosing cholangitis. Here again you see the hypodense featureless colonic wall involves the entirety of the colon. Note the parenchymal atrophy and the approximation of dilated ducts. Obviously there is evidence as well of a prior hepatic resection. Note now the featureless colon with regions of hypodense bowel wall all throughout the entirety of the colon. 
involving even the sigmoid here, and rectum. Pretty much classic chronic ulcerative colitis findings and the classic appearance of its associated sclerosing cholangitis. Our next case is an unusual case of Caroli disease. There is extensive biliary dilation, even an unusual congenital malpositioning of the gallbladder here within the falciform fissure. In addition, however, there is extensive thrombosis of the entire portal venous system. Obviously, that is a hard thing to appreciate on a single image, so we'll go to the video where you can really appreciate, especially here in the portal region, that the more medial structure is actually the portal vein, which you can now see enhancing. Let's look at that again. So all of the tubular hypodense structures you see throughout the liver are a combination of dilated ducts and hypodense thrombosed portal veins. There again, hypodense portal vein becoming enhancing portal vein. Let's look at the entirety of the dilated ductal system and thrombosed portal venous system. And lastly, appreciate that the gallbladder is lying actually in the falciform region, medially displaced from its normal location. So that is a case of Caroli disease with associated portal vein thrombosis. Our last case is an unusual infection, oriental cholangiopathy. There are multiple dilated tubular and cystic structures throughout the liver. Ultimately, you can track most of these dilated hypodense structures back to a communication with the biliary system. In addition, there are numerous biliary calcifications throughout the liver a telltale finding of clonorchus infestation and oriental cholangiopathy. Again, giant dilated cyst-like structures, most of which can be traced back to a dilated ductal moiety. Again, extensive parenchymal calcifications present both within the cysts and within the dilated ductal system. Lastly, you can appreciate the marked hypertrophy of the less involved left liver lobe. So that is a case of oriental cholangiopathy related to chronic clonorchus infestation. And that concludes this session on biliary emergencies.